All right, let's get into it. Great is water. The mountains may crumble, but water makes old things become new. Water brings life where there was death. Los Angeles had found, has found something better than a gold mine. Let all the people say amen. amen. <laughs> you know where that was from? The Los Angeles Times. Right? Sounds like an invocation. Los Angeles Times, July 29th, 1905. It had been leaked to them early that the great Mulholland Aqueduct was going to be ready. And so this was what, this was the lead editorial of the Los Angeles Times. Great as water. Let all the people say amen. All right. Just so you know, this is what the series has been about. This is the whole series, and we're now on water myths, so we're almost done. I don't know how we move through these so quickly, but uh, they sure are fun for me. I hope they are for you. Uh, so what we're doing here, just so you know, so it doesn't seem too weird, is this is what you would study in an intro to mythology class in college. This might well be the modules you would use in your class. So we're going to take that, and then we're going to apply it to our city the city of angels. And so this is how we've applied it. This is, we focused on these quotations and used them as titles for the various aspects, the various mythological dimensions of the city of angels. So for example, a ringside seat at the circus was tricksters, and we had a good time with that. Uh, a ritual to join its fragments is from Jim Morrison and the doors. And tonight we're doing water myths now. One thing you need to remember that we, we keep uh, reminding ourselves of, for good reason, is that Los Angeles is unique. Okay, every city's unique, certainly. Los Angeles is unique in unique ways, I would say. Uh, and they're not all good. This is not a praise, worship, Los Angeles class. Uh, although I do think we see some things that others don't, uh, given the fact that we live here and that we're looking through these mythological lenses. But um, this, is a, this is a story about the city in all its glory. And myth, myth is, myth is kind of neutral in terms of ethics. It, uh, it shows you the ugliness and the beauty, uh, the good and the bad. And so we've seen a lot of different things. One of the things that makes it unique, that makes Los Angeles unique, well, actually two of the things, are, let's say three of the things, topography, climate, and migration. And I showed you this last time, but I think it's worth seeing again. This is the population in millions of each state beginning in 1900. And we're the fifth line down. This is New York, of course. Mm -hmm. Illinois there, we just passed. That is a significant feature of Los Angeles, is that we are a city of migrants, of immigrants even. People came here in droves. They came because of a novel that they read called Ramona. They came because of other fictions they read from the tourists who had been here and from the very de deliberately crafted booster uh, advertising that was done by the City of Commerce, uh, sorry, Chamber of Commerce. They came. And we are, some of us are the products of that. And uh, it, that has identified this city. And I started off calling it an embedded difference. It's a city of embedded differences. And I decided it was better to call it dynamic differences because these differences themselves are always changing. And so one of the things we've discovered in our conversations is that 
that's that's a, a fact of life of Los Angeles is that there are so many different people here believing and doing so many different things that that's that's a unique feature of the city and it has been from the beginning of the anglicized version of the city in fact Kevin Starr says it was there all along with the indigenous people the Tongva and the Chumash among others water we are water 83 percent of the lungs 79% of the muscles and kidneys, 73% of the brain and heart, 64% of the skin, and even 31% of the bones, water. It is the most common element in human beings. Um, 60 to 65% of the water in our bodies is contained inside the cells. I didn't know this. Inside the cells. My sisters always tell me to drink water and I'm like, why? And she says, because it bathes your, you bathe your cells in it. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. It turns out she was right. She usually is. 35 to 40% of the water is outside the cells, extracellular fluid. 71% of the Earth's surface is water covered. Oceans hold most of that, 96.5%. But the water exists in the air, in vapor in rain, in precipitation, in rivers, and lakes, and ice caps, and glaciers, and moisture in the soil, and aquifers, and in us. Moreover, water is always moving. Always moving. Um, it's, uh, we, in the, in the West in particular, we like things to stay still so we can analyze them, but water is not like that. And we're going to see in just a minute how philosophers and uh, spiritual thinkers saw that as an important feature of water and its metaphors, how we use it in metaphor. Of course, water is life. We can't live without water. We can go a few days, um, even longer, without food. We cannot go very long at all without water because we are water. Uh, water is death. We talked about the St. Francis Dam disaster during our tricksters. Uh, evening and the hor horror of that dam breaking and flooding out into um, the ocean and the people who were trapped in the mud and in the water and who just instantly died. Um, water is both life and death and Christian baptism gets that probably better than anything because um, I don't know if you've been baptized but I've been baptized a few times because <laughs> I grew up in Tennessee and we want to make sure we get it right. Uh, and I grew up across the street from a Baptist church, a Southern Baptist church. And uh, I still remember it. I'll never forget it. <laughs> the, there's a tub in the church. Do you know this? There's a tub in the church. So they they have a curtain and they pull back the curtain they fill up the tub and you go into the tub with the minister in front of everybody so it's, it's a spectacle people are watching you in the tub and if he's a good minister he will hold you down just for a full second just so you know what's happening and he will say this buried with Christ in baptism Water is death. Risen, hold it there for a second, let you think about death. Risen to walk in newness of life. Water is life. It is the most powerful substance on earth. Um, it, and you can see that when it's uncontrolled. It is the most powerful substance on earth because it is our very life. We cannot live without it. All right. No wonder then that we find water in the text of so many of our creation stories, our origin myths. Um, it's not in everyone, but it sure is widespread. Uh, I like this, the pyramid text from Egypt. I am the eternal spirit. I am the sun that rose from primeval waters. My soul is God. I am the creator of the world, of the word, sorry. 
So I'm the eternal spirit. I'm the sun. But there was something before me. There was primeval waters. And we keep finding this. Um, in Enuma Elish, the Mesopotamian creation story that informed the Genesis story. Genesis kind of inverts some of the things there. But um, creation is, in Mesopotamia, it is the creation of the waters. It's the waters above and the waters below. And the primal goddess, Tiamat, is cut in two. And that's what makes the waters above and the waters below. And of course, you know the Genesis story. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was, a, was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. There was no earth, or, or the earth was without form and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. We begin always in water. The uh, Rig Veda, uh, a creation story I've read to you a few times because I think it's, it's wonderful because it ends with, I don't know who made this, do you? <laughs> it's wonderful. But it begins this way. Then even nothingness was not, nor existence. Gotta love the Vedas. Even nothingness was not, nor existence. There was no air then, nor the heavens beyond it. What covered it? Where was it? In whose keeping? What was there then in the cosmic water? The water was there. What was there in the cosmic? Cosmic water is almost assumed. I'm not going to read you all these, but there's Hesiod's Theogony that we had a talk on one night. We actually talk about the, how to create a god uh, in our Gods and Monsters series. And we paired the Theogony with the Numa Elish, but... This is my favorite. <clears throat> this is the great Mesoamerican uh, Kiche Mayan creation account, the Papal Vu. And this is the opening, one of the opening lines. This is the account. Here it is. Now it still ripples. It still murmurs, ripples. It sighs, still hums, and it is empty under the sky. Poetry. We begin in water. Water stays with us. Uh, I'm not going to read Freud on the interpretation of dreams to you because I think you probably know what he's going to say. Um, he says this, birth is regularly expressed in dreams by some connection to water. One plunges into the water or comes out of the water, which w means one gives birth to or is born. born. Consistent mythological trope here that also has scientific relevance. Uh, this is the amniotic fluid, right? You are born in water. You, you are conceived and live in water until you are born in, onto the land, which is why creation myths can easily be seen as an individual's own story. Jung said this in the Collected Works 9, water is the commonest symbol for the unconscious. The lake in the valley is the unconscious, which lies, as it were, underneath consciousness, so that it is often referred to as the subconscious, usually with the pejorative connotation of an inferior consciousness. Water is the valley spirit, the water dragon of the Tao, whose nature resembles water, a yang and the yin, referring to the Chinese um, polar ideas. Therefore, water means spirit that has become unconscious. A pretty powerful notion that you will see replicated. And in fact, I'm going to read you some of these replicated in literature and in film, by the way. Heinrich Zimmer, the great endologist, said this, the waters of life are the womb of all forms of the world, as well as their grave in which they are reborn. They circulate in and build. They carry and dissolve every form. They are the palpable element of all divine, divine maya, whose nature the saints and seers tentatively try to grasp. They hold the secret of the maya, this maya, as the force of their own versatile nature, and do not yield it. 
but let it be tasted when someone opens up to them. How the world comes into being every hour outside as world gestalt in the flow of coming into being and happening, coming to the fore the, as gestalt of the inner world from the darkness of the unconscious into the light of consciousness. All this can be experienced, but how can it be fathomed? The, the first philosopher, um, as we say, was Thales. And we don't have any of Thales' works, um, but he was, well, we know him through Aristotle, mainly, who quoted him. Uh, and he believed, um, uh, his dates are 624 BCE to 546 BCE. So he's in that interesting age, sometimes called the actual axial age. So he's living at the time of the Hebrew prophets. He's living at the time of Siddhartha Gautama. He's living at the time of Lao Tzu uh, and Kung Fu Se, roughly. Uh, and this is Thales of Miletus. First philosopher, first scientist, really. He was the first thinker that we have on record who did not want to, to rehearse the myths of Homer or the poetry of Homer. Uh, and try to apply some other kind of thinking to the world that we would recognize as scientific. For him, everything comes out of water. And in fact, earth floats on water. Uh, and that's how he explained earthquakes, by the way, which is pretty cool and wrong. Um, the Tao Te Ching, the great text of Lao Tzu, or Li Pu Yang, uh, 81 little paragraphs of genius. And here are two of them. The supreme good is like water, which nourishes, nourishes all things without trying to. It is content with the low places that people disdain. Thus it is like the Tao. In dwelling, live close to the ground. In thinking, keep to the simple. In conflict, be fair and generous. In governing, don't try to control. In work, do what you enjoy. In family life, be completely present. When you are content to be simply yourself and don't compare or compete, everybody will respect you. Be like water. And then another chapter. Nothing in the world is as soft and yielding as water. Yet, for dissolving the hard and inflexible, nothing can surpass it. Go visit the Grand Canyon sometime. The soft overcomes the hard. The gentle overcomes the rigid. Everyone knows this is true, but few can put it into practice. Therefore, the master remains serene in the midst of sorrow. Evil cannot enter her heart because she has given up helping. She is the people's greatest help. Two words seem paradoxical. Bruce Lee. He was training in the martial arts in the 50s. Uh, he went sailing. He slapped the water angrily and found it instructive about Kung Fu. I struck it, he said, but I did not suffer hurt. I then tried to grasp a handful of it, but this proved impossible. That was it. He recalled, I wanted to be like the nature of water. Ralph Waldo Emerson, the water understands civilization well. Yes, it does, because we almost always build cities by rivers. The water understands civilization well. It wets my foot, but prettily. It chills my life, but wittily. It is not disconcerted, it is not brokenhearted. Well used, it decketh joy, adorneth, doubleth joy. Ill used, it will destroy. In perfect time and measure, with a face of golden pleasure, elegantly destroy. True words are paradoxical. Philip Larkin, the great British poet, a poem called Water. If <laughs> Pardon me. If I were called in to construct a religion, I should make use of water. Going to church would entail a fording to dry. 
different clothes. My liturgy would employ images of sousing, pouring water. My liturgy would employ images of sousing, a furious, devout drench. And I should raise in the east a glass of water where any angled light would congregate endlessly. T.S. Eliot from the Four Quartets. The river is within us. The sea is all about us. The sea is the land's edge also. The granite into which it reaches. The beaches where it tosses its hints of earlier and other creation. The starfish, the horseshoe crab, the whale's backbone, the pools where it offers to our curiosity. The more delicate algae and the sea anemone. It tosses up our losses. The torn seine, the shattered lobster pot, the broken oar, and the gear of foreign dead men. The sea has many voices, many gods, and many voices. All right, so there is a very quick survey of water and intellectual history. Uh, we didn't skip anything. <laughs> uh, but you get the sense, and I think you know this both intellectually and I think you know it experientially. There is something about water. Water in Los Angeles. Okay, so just saying that phrase, you already know this is a thing. It is a thing for us, right? Water is a thing for Angelinos. It's not a thing for uh, people in Seattle or Portland or even Albuquerque or or, um, well, it is maybe for Phoenix, but not in the same way. Water is a thing for us. It's one of our symbols. It's part of our story. It's an important part of our story. This is Kevin Starr, um, the, basically the historian of California. Um, still, he said, he writes, it had to be admitted, even in bad times, um, that you could not negate the cumulative achievement of, of California as a fused instance of American and global cultures. Here, among other things, nature had been supplemented and heroically rearranged so as to make possible a population of 36 million, an estimated 55 million by 2040, which natural conditions alone could never have supported. Not since ancient Rome, or the creation of Holland, had any society comparably sub subdued, appropriated, and rearranged its water resources, or used this water relegated infrastructure, including hydroelectricity, to establish again so swiftly the foundations for a mass society at once agricultural and industrialized, or created such extensive cities and suburbs in such short order or linked these built environments in an equally rapid time with highways, freeways, and bridges of comparable magnitude. He, he continues, it began with water, the sin qua non of any civilization. In California, two thirds of the annual precipitation falls in the northern third of the state. Much of Southern California is desert terrain. Despite its two great rivers, the Sacramento and the San Joaquin, the Great Central Valley itself is a semi-arid steppe with soil baked in by the sun to such hardness that it frequently had to be broken with dynamite. For California to become inhabitable and productive and in, in its entirety would require a statewide water system of heroic magnitude. Californians recognize this almost immediately. I should say that one of my ancestors is, was part of this water war in the San Joaquin Valley in the early 20th century. His name was Clarence Salyer, but they called him Cockeye because he had an eye that went off like that. And that's how you talked about people. <laughs> uh, and apparently, he was an amazing asshole. Um, which, and so he got rich, because I think those two might go together sometime. Uh, no, seriously, he was said, um, I don't know how much of this is apocryphal, but 
again, this is San Joaquin Valley. So he was, he was said to walk into a bar there, go up to this guy, knock him off the bar stool by punching him in the face, taking money out of his jacket and walking out. And the story goes, the guy kind of got up and shook himself and said, well, I admire a man who knows how to collect his debts. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he was a jerk by all accounts. Our old friend Carrie McWilliams says this, that we live with a water paradox. Quote, water is the lifeblood of Southern California. Turn off the flow of water that now reaches the region from such remote places as the Owens Valley and the Colorado River, and the whole region would be bankrupt. The absence of local water resources is indeed the basic weakness of Southern California, its eternal problem. Throughout Southern California, there's not a single river. As people, <coughs> as people normally understand the term, not a single natural lake, not a single creek with a year-round flow of water. And what causes more damage in this region than droughts? Floods. Such a Southern California thing to go without something for so long, and then when it comes, it destroys everything. Southern California is the land of the freak flood, according to McWilliams. In this semi-arid region, it can rain as nowhere else in America. In fact, it neither rains nor pours. The skies simply open up and dump oceans of water on the land. It's supposed to rain tonight, Wes? Isn't it? Yeah. Into this mix, comes a couple of tricksters, as you might imagine. One of them, Charles Mallory Hatfield. He was called Hatfield the Rainmaker. Uh, he refused the title of the Rainmaker. Genius. He says, the term is too broad. I merely assist nature. I only persuade the moisture to come down. Uh, he, was, he made that hundreds of thousands of dollars in the early 20th century in this re region and in the Southwest. Um, apparently, his method was evaporating tanks that he would bring into town full of, quote, certain chemicals, the character of which must necessarily remain secret, unquote. So he goes down to San Diego. They're, they have a drought, and they pay him in 1903. Sorry, sorry, this is, sorry, I'm mixing my stories up. There's a guy here in Los Angeles County who, uh, whose crops are suffering. And he's never heard of this guy. He pays him $50. And uh, within a week, an inch of rain falls. That begins his reputation. Um, and, and he begins to be hired by governments and ranchers who will pay him up to $10,000 per rainfall per uh, instance of rain, precipitation. In the city of San Diego in 19... <laughs> I, this is such a great Southern California story. In 1960, 1916, the city of San Diego pays the rainmaker to fill their reservoir. 16 inches of rain fell in two days. 18 million gallons filled the reservoir and overflowed, flooding the streets and bridges and closing the San Diego World's Fair. The city refused to pay his fee. <laughs> so, of course, it was determined that what this guy was was a meteorolo meteorologist, basically. He, he would look at weather patterns and figure out what was going on, and he would always you know, say that, you know, well, it depends. It could be three or four weeks. Okay, well, you know, most of us, if we could school ourselves in climatology, meteorology, we could probably do that. We could probably hit that mark, you know, within three or four weeks. Um, and then, of course, we have William Mulholland, again, whose monument is right down at the bottom of this hill that no one knows about, kind of like UPR. Um, it, you really should see it sometime. It's amazing. And his famous quote, there it is, take it, it is emblazoned there. I'm like, wow, you want, you, want to be, you want to remember that phrase, do you? Especially in regard to water, 
in Los Angeles because <clears throat> I don't want to get into this now, but as we discovered during the trickster talk, he stole that water, literally stole it from the Owens River Valley. Uh, and there was some death involved, by the way, but yeah, there it is, take it, and you can stand in one of the pipes of, of, of the aqueduct, you can see how big it is. But this is what he says when he brings water to Los Angeles. A mighty river has been brought out of the mountain wilderness, across the desert swept by winds of heat, and all of its vast energy utilized to generate electric power for the factories and the foundries, the mills and the smelters and the refineries that have come and will come, the aqueduct brings assurance of metropolitan grandeur and future prosperity such as but few cities of the world can hope to attain. Listen to this uh, again from Mulholland. It almost echoes Genesis 1. The aqueduct is completed and it is good. No one knows better than I how much we needed the water. They didn't. Not then. We have the fertile lands and the climate. Only water was needed to make of this region a tremendously rich and productive empire. And now we have it on this crude platform is an altar. I'm not making this up. Is an altar to consecrate the delivery of this valuable water supply and dedicate to you and posterity posterity forever a magnificent body of water. And it is magnificent. Look at it. It's like a great snake. All right. Water in Los Angeles. Remember our old friend Rainer Bannum, the architecture of four ecologies. Uh, and he was um, <laughs> probably the first um, architecture, architecture critic to appreciate Los Angeles. I think that's absolutely true, actually. Um, a British man who came over and just fell in love with Los Angeles. And one of, uh, one of his four e ecologies, by the way, is Autopia, the Autotopia, the Auto-Utopia. And he spoke glowingly of the freeways and, and how we move through the freeways. Well, his first ecology is Surferbia, the beach cities and the beach experience, really, uh, which he draws from Malibu, uh, all the way down to, um, where does he go? Um, he goes into Orange County, actually, and calls that surfer, uh, yeah, surferbia. Um, <laughs> the draw to Santa Monica, for example, he says, is the city's distinctive civic atmosphere. This is in the 60s. Um, Venice he says, has the charm of decay. But this will almost certainly disappear in the redevelopments that must follow. I didn't say it was right. He was, he was interesting. Uh, Manhattan Beach, Redondo Beach, Hermosa Beach. Um, populated by the boardwalk and the surfboard. Or as Bannum says, the concrete boardwalk characterizes mile after mile the true surferbian shore. <laughs> yeah, and this is this is him talking about the symbol and meaning of the surfboard. Leaning on the seawall are stuck in the sand like plastic megaliths. These surfboards concentrate practically the whole capacity of Los Angeles to create stylistic decorative imagery and to fix those images with all the panoply of modern visual and material techniques. And all remember in the service of the preferred, preferred local form of the noble savage, pitting the surfer, pitting his nearly naked muscles and skilled reactions against the full force of the mighty hulking Pacific Ocean. Okay, you yeah, know, he really loves Los Angeles. Of course, and I didn't think about this till we started, uh, till I was researching this, but there's a whole genre of music that comes from our proximity to the water. And I, I've never been a fan of the Beach Boys, but um, 
I, I'm told, and I, I saw it again in the research, that what they did musically, what Brian Wilson in particular did musically, was actually phenomenal. Let's see if I have a quote here. Um, Uh, with these hits and others, the group's bassist and songwriter Brian Wilson created a new sound in rock and roll called Surf Sound. It was a combination of older rock verities set in entirely new lyrical and musical contexts. This is Harry Summerall. Oh, here's the one I wanted to read. Three of the Beach Boys, Brian Wilson pretty much single-handedly raised the craft of pop songwriting from the awkwardly sublunar to the gracefully sublime. This is Jeff Myers. Uh, Eric Davis says, not only did the Beach Boys write a soundtrack to the early 60s, but Brian let loose a delicate and joyful art pop unique, joyful art pop unique in music history and presaged the mellowness, mellowness, sorry, so fundamental to 70s California pop. Hmm. Um, so, beach music originated here. And then there is Malibu. And nobody writes about California better than Joan Didion. This is from a little piece called Quiet Days in Malibu. In a way, it seems the most idiosyncratic of beach communities. Doesn't it? It does. 27 miles of coastline with no hotel, no passable restaurant, nothing, this is in the 60s, though I don't think much has changed. Nothing to attract the traveler's dollar. It is not a resort. It certainly isn't. No one vacations or holidays in Malibu, as those words are conventionally understood, and that's certainly true. Its principal residential street, the Pacific Coast Highway, is quite literally a highway, California 1, which runs from the Mexican border to the Oregon line and brings Greyhound buses and refrigerated produce trucks and 16-wheel gasoline tankers hurtling past the front windows of houses frequ frequently bought and sold for over a million dollars. Over a million dollars. That's crazy. Uh, the water off Malibu, she continues, is neither as clear nor as tropically colored as the water off La Jolla. The beaches at Malibu are neither as wide as white nor as wide as the beach at Carmel. The hills are scrubby and barren, infested with bikers and rattlesnakes, scarred with cuts and old burns and new RV parks. For these and other reasons, Malibu tends to astonish and disappoint those who have never before seen it. And yet its very name remains in the imagination of people all over the world, a kind of shorthand for the easy life. I had not before 1971 and will probably not again live in a place with a Chevrolet named after it. <laughs> then there's Venice. Um, there are other descriptions of Venice, but I kind of like this one from Lawrence Lipton. Um, a little piece called Slum by the Sea from his book, The Holy Barbarians. Now, Lipton's kind of a beat writer, and so like Kerouac, he didn't think much of Los Angeles, and Lipton doesn't think much of Venice, but you can make, your, make up your own mind here. It is Sunday in Venice. Not the Venice of the Piazza San Marco in the memories of the Doges. Venice, California, the Venice of St. Mark's Hotel, where the arched colonnades are plaster, scaling off now and cracked. By only a few decades of time, earthquake and decay. This is Venice by the Pacific, dreamed up by a man named Kenny at the turn of the century, a 19th century capital M man of capital V vision, as trite as a penny postcard. He went broken hard and in pocket, trying to carry his Cook's Tour memories of the history city on the Adriatic, <coughs> excuse me, into the 20th century. And that's right, uh, Abbot Kenny was a world traveler, and um, including Italy, but including a lot of places, and came back and founded Venice and wanted to make it like Venice, Italy, of course. The, uh, Lipton continues, the aged and the young and the misfits, all the misfits of the world, 
the too fat and the too lean, the too tall and the too short, the jerk, the drip, the half-wit, and the spastic, the hair lip and the gimp, all the broken, the doomed, the drunk, the disillusioned, hurting together for a little warmth where a one-room kitchenette is an apartment and the naked electric bulb hangs suspended from the ceiling like an exposed nerve. That's, that is kind of Venice, isn't it? <laughs> Apologies to Venetians here. And then, of course, there's the river. This is uh, Chief Red Blood Anthony Morales, uh, a Tongva chief, talking about the LA River that you will not recognize. For KCET Public Media, this is Departures. All of the rivers and streams were sources of food and housing and transportation in terms of the build, being able to build canoes. But the plant life was incredibly rich. The first thing that we would have noticed if we, if we could go back in time to what this river once looked like would be the great willow forests that spread from the openings of the river where it begins up north all the way down to the Long Beach area near Pavumna. The great forests of willows. These willows provided two things. Well, maybe more than two. Certainly, for housing, they became the framework for houses. So we have that. Willows also provided medicine, because it's from the willow that you get a very early kind of aspirin. And there's construction, construction for fencing, construction for the great yova'ar, the great ceremonial circles and the great shamanic enclosures. So willows, then reeds, miles upon miles upon miles of reeds, great reed forests, so thick that the Spanish talk about they would take days to cross through them. The reeds provided basketry for some of the greatest baskets that the state of California Indians ever made. Beautiful. Covering for the house. The thatches for mats that would be woven to cover the houses. Mats to cover the floors of the house. And in terms of basketry, it, it's so difficult to even imagine that a household would have at least 25 different kinds of baskets for different purposes from the basket that would hold the crushed acorn meal or to hold the acorns themselves or to hold medicines or to hold clothing or for storage for necklaces and so forth. So those are two plants alone, just the willow and the reeds. Along the banks, countless plants, countless flowers, things like what the Spanish called yerba santa, manzanita, arrowweed, mule fat, all of these plants were food, they were medicine, they were uh, used for uh, ceremonial uh, implements, they were used for the making of headgear so that feathers could be attached to them, for beadwork, and then what further up the banks and all over the hillsides, the great glory of California, the oak tree. The great staple diet that was a central food item, not only for the Tongva, but just about almost all the Indians of California, that oak tree was central. Uh, each family owned its oak grove, maintained it, pruned it, watered it, weeded it, harvested it. It was a glory. So follow the plant life down the river. In some small pocket parks are being reestablished replanted with the original indigenous plant life of early California. We can still see bits and pieces of that as you go from little from pocket to pocket park down the river. That's a great project that many organizations have been working with. It was said by some of the early explorers who came through that a squirrel could jump on an oak tree up at the foothills around, let's say, Sierra Madre, and go from oak tree to oak tree and never touch the ground until that little squirrel had reached Long Beach. So this was a land of forests. It was rich with food. And of course, in those forests were deer and lion and bear and countless birds. So it was paradise. 
the land of angels. For more stories. It was the Los Angeles River, the primary water source until 1900. Then, of course, it flooded because it always flooded. Um, there. That's the 1938 flood. There were floods before that, um, and, um, and, and it was just crazy. It would, the water would come down because remember what McWilliams said, it comes down when it comes. It comes in buckets. And uh, it would just, the water would find its own way, as water does, and it would care nothing for uh, human-made structures, as you can see. Where is that? That's in Elysium Park, right? Near Elysium Park. Um, and so, 20 years and three and a half billion barrels of concrete later, we now get the L.A. River that we know. The, um, it, well, as someone said, it, um, it was a freeway for moving, it's a freeway, which I like, a freeway for moving flood water efficiently and safely from mountains to the sea. Yet another freeway, which worked out well for Terminator 2, of course. <laughs> Which is what, I don't know, that's what I think of when I hear L.A. River. I think of that chase scene, which is sad or awesome, I don't know. Um, in 1985, a writer named Louis McAdams took a pair of wire cutters and two friends down to the L.A. River and cut a hole in the fence. And according to the nonprofit he founded, Friends of the L.A. River, quote, Louis and two friends, whiskey in their blood, and wire cutters in their hands cut a hole in the surrounding chain link fence that had defined the river as an inhospitable drainage ditch. With one fell snip, McAdams declared the LA River open for the people. And it is. Um, the US Army Corps of Engineers, uh, once the river opened, uh, it's they who built the river, so to speak, who paved the river. Um, they said it was not safe for people to use, just two small sections. So in response, a satirical writer named George Wolfe, and I love this description, a rogue Army Corps biologist, Heather Wiley, wouldn't you like to be known as a rogue Army Corps biologist? That sounds awesome. They decided to kayak the entire thing from the valley to Long Beach. Uh, they set out, sorry, they set out from Canoga Park in July 20, uh, 2008, reached Long Beach three days later, and it was documented by photographer Tom Andrews. Now, this is, um, we, we've been kind of, um, I don't know, I think appropriately appreciative of Los Angeles to this point, mostly. But here's a great loss. Here is something that, um, and now we're moving to, into Mike Davis territory, so it's going to get a little bleaker. Um, Davis points out that this was a significant loss in you know, a little piece called Killing the L.A. River. Um, Mike Davis is an is a ecology of fear, and, and this is from Ecology of Fear, by the way, this quote. Let me just read you the quote. Uh, Frederick Law Olmsted and his partner Bartholomew. Now, if you know Frederick Law Olmsted, uh, incredible landscape designer who did Central Park and all kinds of wonderful spaces in America, he was involved in the LA River in the early 20th century. And he and his partner Barth Bartholomew produced a report on what to do with the LA River. Mike Davis, Ecology of Fear, Olmsted and Bartholomew emphasized in their report that flood control, which was the issue, you don't want that happening, but flood control could be accomplished by different combinations of planning and public works. Their preference was to strictly limit private encroachment on the 50-year floodplain. They wanted to conserve broad natural channels in which storm waters could spread, irrigating and fertilizing riverside landscapes that out of flood season would serve as nature preserves, recreational parks, and scenic parkways. 
right? Can you imagine the Los Angeles River like that? You know, you preserve the floodplain, you don't let people build there, but then that, we don't ever not let people build somewhere in Los Angeles. Uh, but it could have been amazing. And by the way, uh, Mike Davis's book, Ecology of Fear, is, is a direct response to Rainer Banham's um, very light and happy f architecture for ecologies. He's like, you want an ecology? Here's an ecology. LA is ecology of fear. Uh, we're going to come back to that book, by the way, especially for Apocalypse next week. And then to close, um, what I find really interesting about water in Los Angeles is how we represent it. What do we say? And when I have visitors here, or when I was doing the walking tours for the Conservancy downtown, I would, I would ask people, I said, what do you see here when you look at water uh, environments in downtown LA? And they said, seems like you really want to know that you have, want everyone to know you have water. I'm like, yes, we do. We have water. Please don't worry about it. We've got enough, right? This has been, Mike Davis calls this an obsession. I think he's right. Uh, because even when Mulholland was doing his work in the late 19th and early 20th century, there was not that much of a problem. We needed a stable water supply. We didn't need the whole Owens River Valley. Um, th there's been this obsession about water in Los Angeles. Sure, we need it. We don't have a natural free-flowing body of water. And so it seems to me that we're, that in our representations of water, we might find something interesting. And I don't know if you've seen these places, but I just wanted to show them to you since we were talking about, you're laughing at the spine? Oh, okay. This is great. This is, I'm gonna show you three places, three installations that involve water and they're all downtown. Um, this is McGuire Gardens, um, which is on the west side of the Central Library, which is itself uh, a brilliant building with a brilliant history that Susan Orlean has just written about, by the way. She has a new book out about the Central Library downtown. But this was, uh, well, because it's LA, this is not the original installation, because they paved over it for a parking lot, the oh. original. Joni Mitchell was right. Um, she's always right. Um, so in, when is this? I think it's 86. Um, Judd Fine, the sculptor, was asked to, to recreate what's called the Well of Scribes, uh, which Bertram Goodhue, the architect of the Central Library, had initially uh, commissioned I can't remember the guy's name, I'm sorry. Uh, but anyway, um, so if you should just do this sometimes. This isn't going to do it justice. But again, west side of the Central Library, if you come in on Flower Street, from Flower Street to the library, you go up three, you go up steps, you go up an incline, and at each point there are three pools. And these are the three pools. The first one is called Bright. And that's it right there. And uh, the, it's probably hard to tell, but this is a map of the world here on that um, front piece. And it has marked on it great library fires, including Alexandria and London and, and Los Angeles. So that's amazing in itself. But notice the creatures here. This is, the whole installation is called Spine. So this is about a book spine, but also the human spine is the kind of center of well thought. Um, and so you can see here we are, we're trying to get out of the water. We didn't quite make it, you know, as a species. We're trying to get out, reaching up, got our head out, but we died right there. <laughs> That's okay. Next is lucid. So we go from bright to lucid. And you see that, um, uh, notice the different text. There's so much, I could spend two hours talking to you about this installation, uh, but I'm not going to. But notice now the text is different. You've gone from a map, you've gone from a kind of ideogrammic text to actual fonts here. This whole thing represents our evolution with the apex, the zenith being the library, right? The sum 
total of knowledge. Um, and you see, now we're up on that rock. We're still alive. We made it. All right? It's all happening. And then this is the highest pool, the one nearest to the library itself, and it is called Clear. Notice that we are now an eagle about to launch off the rock. Uh, I am told by people who would know that um, that head there <coughs> is the head of a woman that was used in Terminator 2 as a, some sort of model. So they thought they'd stick it up <laughs> to the library. <laughs> Sounds like a great LA story. Uh, so yeah, that's the clear, uh, and that's the future. And if you go there, and I encourage you to go there, the very first step has nothing on it. And the very last step has nothing on it. But in between are, are various writings and sayings. For example, there's, there's a quote from Mark Twain on one of the steps that says, I can, I can do a mountain, of, I can create a mountain of words with this thing. He'd just seen a typewriter for the first time. So it's this magnificent, dense, beautiful representation of human evolution to knowledge and water is right in the center of it. In fact, because that's our life. We start with a skeleton trying to get out of the water. We end with an eagle launching from the rock. This is actually one of my favorites. Uh, this is called Robert Graham. This is called Source Figure. It's the Bunker Hill Steps. And um, you can see not too well with the photos I have, but if you've been on the Bunker Hill Steps, you know this rivulet right here of water goes all the way down from, and this is at the top of the steps, so she's the source figure. Notice she has sea creatures around her. Notice also, well, I don't know if you can tell, but the sculptor intended this to be an African-American woman. Uh, so she is the source figure, and from her flows uh, life all the way down, and it's designed, if you know, when you get to the last step, you're right across the street from the library, which is beautiful and awesome. There are also some more Robert Graham sculptures in um, the Wells Fargo Plaza. And then this, I don't know, this may be my favorite. I, they're all my favorite. I don't know if you know Lita Albuquerque, but she's an installation artist, landscape artist, uh, who did, you ever been to the cathedral downtown, the big fountain? That's her. Uh, and she's fantastic. And she did this piece that I just love that no one knows about. So uh, this is on 555 South Hope Street. So actually, if you if you are facing the front door of the library, the central library, and you go straight through, and you come out the other side, you will come out into this installation. And I didn't know what it was until I studied it. And uh, you'll come out onto the pavement there, and there's this pattern in the pavement. And it's a star field. It's a star pattern. And then you keep walking, and you will go. Uh, that building at 555 South Hope used to be Church of the Open Door. So you'll go to a monument to the Church of the Open Door, uh, which is really cool. But then if, you've, if you come out of that and you walk down the sidewalk south, you will not see this. You will see instead on the sidewalk a big blue circle. And, you, and it's kind of faded now. It needs to be painted. And you're like, what is that? If you look left, you will see steps, and you'll see that straight blue line taking you up the steps. That's the blue water line. And this is what you see. You see this magnificent, ancient ceremonial site, and it's right in the middle of downtown. I love it. Uh, you know, you've got people having lunch. See them right there? They're having lunch. Uh, because I think she's trying to say this, these are our new temples, these financial centers. Uh, but look at that. There's a fantastic, so you have the sun to worship right there. It's a sun god uh, temple. And then to the right on this picture and there is a pool. And what she's reflecting there is the U.S. Bank building. So again, it's water, uh, which would, water and sun, which would be crucial and has always been crucial to us, water and sun. 
All right, got to finish up. Water mists in Los Angeles, how perfect. What a perfect metaphor for us. It's chaos, it's creativity, it's life and death, the need to control it, and yet the fragility of our control because water is so powerful. I think water speaks liminality. I think, you know, I don't go to the beach that much, but I need to know it's there. I need to know that I live near it. You know, I, I like edges. I like living on edges. And I'm not just being silly or romantic. I mean that mythologically, symbolically. Um, Courtney and I were talking, Courtney and I were both in Boston for a while. And he's like, yeah, I got to go back east. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. And he's like, yeah, I know. I got to get out of there as soon as I get there. I'm the same way. I want to be here. I, I guess that's an edge, too. I hadn't thought about it. Boston's an edge um, with a lot of pubs. But I want to be on this edge. I want to be on the western edge. I want to be west to the west. And I just made this up. Uh, no charge for this. Feel free to use it. We've talked about hyper-reality. I think with water in Los Angeles, it's hyper-hydrology. I think we're obsessed with water, and we represent it as often and as much as we can. I remember a couple of years ago during the drought, I was living downtown. And do you remember, I don't know if you ever saw them, if you weren't downtown, but they were trying to get you, the city was trying to get you to conserve water. And they, they created this droplet character, I forget what his name was, but he was a drop of water. And he was on the bus stop stands. And I remember one of them was, uh, let's say it was called Droppy. <laughs> And, it's, and, it's, and he's standing there, this drop of water, and he's looking at you, and he says, I don't, it, it says, we don't mind if you take a long shower, but droppy sure does. <laughs> Dude, that's devastating. I can't look at it. Los Angeles hyper hydrology. Thank you for listening.